We are joined in studio today by Frida Canini. This powerful young woman has the energy and initiative to fill an entire room. She's here today to talk about her immigrant journey, her many community involvements, and a special project she's bringing to Grand Rapids, Michigan. Frida, it's such a delight to have you. Welcome to Feel Like You Belong. Thank you so much for having me, Alan. You bet. So tell us a little bit about your, your personal immigrant story. Uh, my first time I came to America was um, 2001. I came to Disney. I was an intern and I worked there for one and a half years. Disney in Florida or California? In Florida. Okay. Disney World. And um, I was right out, out of school. I came the first time to Orlando. It was beautiful and exciting and so much was going on at Disney. So what did you do at Disney? I worked as uh, I worked in the restaurant. So you weren't wearing a costume? No, I didn't wear a costume. <laughs> My roommate used to wear a costume. Wow, okay. Yes, she was the mini and she was from New Jersey. Okay. Yes, so Good. I used to work in uh, one of the restaurants. I worked in several different restaurants mm -hmm. and uh, we were many of us coming from different parts of Africa, different parts of the world. They do have an exchange program oh, okay. for students. So I was there, I was working in uh, restaurants that were African themed. What was your first impression of the United States as you, when you came? I mean, what was, what was that like for you? It was um, a beautiful place. I liked it. I, Orlando was warm, so it looked like my country. <laughs> it wasn't cold mm -hmm. like Michigan. I loved it because also we were so many of us from different parts of the world. Uh, I loved different people from different places. The experience was amazing. Mm -hmm. I, I got to meet and become friends with people from South Africa, Jamaica. So it was very exciting. And of course, meeting people uh, in America that were showing me different. I wasn't used to um, like rides. That was not kind of the fun <laughs> I was used to. So sure. I, I was being told to go to this rides it was it was crazy but it was it was nice it was a very welcoming program they coordinate everything for you and how long did it last i was there for a little bit over a year okay yeah okay so it was really nice exciting program i, I got to visit disney parks for free bringing mm -hmm. friends i had so many friends that wanted to call me and ask if i can bring you used to get four uh Tickets free. Four passes. Uh -huh. Four passes, uh -huh. yes. Okay. And so I handled it. So when you went back, did this plant some kind of a seed in your mind when you went back to Kenya? I actually didn't go back to Kenya. I went to UK. Okay. So right after Disney, I went to the United um, Kingdom. Mm -hmm. I was working at an island called Jersey Island. It's a channel island. Okay. So my friends told me about it. When my program was over, I applied to work there. And I met so many people also from... Uh, Kenya that were working in uh, the program. It was also related to the college I went to because I was in a hospitality school in Kenya. Sure, got it. Yeah, so it was nice. They, it was very different from the island. Everything was so small compared to Orlando. And the island, most people walked. And I was like, wait, we used to take cars everywhere in, at, in Orlando. <laughs> yeah, but it was, um, and then eventually after two years, like the second year, I ended up going back to Kenya. Okay. Yes, so it was, it was actually a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So much, uh, some fun, some, sometimes I was worried I won't see my family again, but then luckily I was able to go after two years. Everything had changed so much, I felt like I was gone forever. Mm -hmm. uh, the little kids I knew, they were older, um, but everything still was fun. So how did you end up back in the States? After two years and a half in UK, I, uh, first I worked at Jersey Island, and then I moved to the mainland, the UK, UK itself. I was in um, working in a place called Tosta. It's very close to Buckingham, but not Buckingham um, Palace, just another small town in England. I was working there for about one year, and then I applied to go back to a hospitality program and I came through the American Hospitality Academy. Okay. It's in Orlando. Okay. Yes, yeah, so that's how I got back to the United States. So how did you make it from warm Orlando to <laughs> chilly Michigan? Yes, that's what I still wonder. <laughs> I was very, um, I mean, I was working through, you know, the program, I was doing everything, and then I knew people here in Michigan, okay. some friends. So they told me it's actually a good place 
they didn't tell me enough about the snow. They bring you in the yeah. summer, you say, oh, this is lovely. Yes, I mean, when I was working at Disney the first time, as I mentioned, before I went to UK, I met a couple from Michigan. They, they, are, they love, uh, they go to winter, uh, when it's winter, they go to Orlando. So they, they became my friends when I was working for Disney and they invited me here. So my first visit to Michigan was Livonia mm -hmm. to see Michigan and it was totally different. It was in the fall because they wanted me to see the changes of the colors. Sure. The, and then I, I thought the roads were terrible compared to Orlando. I was like, mm. what's going on? They said, oh, we put salt when it snows. And I'm it like, okay. damages the roads. You know what I'm Yes. <laughs> and so I understood uh, because Orlando roads are perfect. Yeah. Um, and then um, after the, like the second part, when I came, I just talked to friends, like I said, and they invited me here to just see it. And then I felt like I would just stay here. Mm -hmm. So I moved here in 2005. So as I mentioned in my intro, you have really embraced Grand Rapids. You have really made this your home. And you, you have founded a couple of organizations. Uh, tell us about West Michigan Kenyans. Yes, West Michigan Kenyans, I started it in 2013. So I began the organization after I had a very difficult time. I lost my mom in 2012. So that was the, the lowest point of my life, basically. Mm -hmm. I, and uh, my mom was everything to me. She was a single mom. She, she was just the strongest person I know, beautiful inside and out. And, when I lost her, I felt really, really devastated, and I didn't know where to turn to. I didn't think anybody understood the pain I was feeling. I started to think of something I could do that would make me probably, I mean, feel better mm -hmm. about myself, but also help somebody else who goes through something like that. Mm -hmm. And you also found an African church to, to join. Yes, time. I found the church. I actually, after my mom passed, I was in a very big church here locally. And through my struggles with my mom, uh, financial needs that I had, because I had to pay all our medical uh, expenses, and they were a lot because there's no insurance. So I used to pay everything. I don't and she was back in Kenya. She was back in Kenya. She, uh, the oncology and everything was charging so much. Oh my. And um, I think uh, within few months, I had no, no money anywhere. I started taking out my 401k. Yes, and I really wanted to save my mom so bad. And so uh, it didn't work out. Obviously, she kept getting worse. I mean, sometimes it was, she was getting better. But uh, chemo, uh, radiation, uh, medicine, it was very standard, probably sometimes low standard of what we get here. But it was still costing a lot. Sure. So I was going to Resurrection Life, and when I started having so many financial issues, uh, they really didn't come um, across like they wanted to support me. Um, well, and it's really hard, I think, when you have a lifetime of certain cultural expectations, yes. and you're in a different country, they d people don't know how to respond yes, yes. in a way that's really meaningful to you. Very true, because I remember talking to some of the deacons who were supposed to talk to me, understand what um, they didn't understand. Like, what are you, you know, if you don't have money, you don't have money. Mm -hmm. And um, they didn't understand why somebody didn't have insurance. And I said, in my country, you only have insurance through a company. Mm -hmm. You don't have it on your own. Yeah. So it was still hard. And uh, I felt a lot of the, like rejection and nobody knew what I needed. Um, but, but you found an African church. Yes, and I continued to go to that big church, but then eventually um, my mother passed, and that time I was really rock bottom because I was owing a lot of money. Not owing myself. My mom owed a lot of money at the hospital. It was about 21,000 U.S. dollars. And um, unfortunately in Kenya, the system was crazy because when you pass away and you haven't paid or if you're in the hospital you haven't paid your dues they keep you there so they held my mom's oh body my. yes and they said I can't bury her until we pay and there was nobody else who worked just me well wow. so she was uh, stuck in the mug for a little while two weeks probably I started fundraising here mm -hmm. and actually that's when the um, African church found out and started wanting to help me oh. They invited me, said we can host a fundraiser here at our church. 
and it was amazing because it was a very very tiny church at that time I think there was like four families if I can remember but they were very loving caring mm -hmm. they wanted to support me I wasn't a member but they were still very open sure and so they started to just do fundraisers I think uh, and then friends chipped in and I was able to get to half probably about 10 and so I was halfway through and then people in Kenya also raised money and that money was also put towards that. So I think I owed about 4,000 on October 15, and then they said my mother can be released to be buried. Wow. Uh, this church was very kind. Uh, my pastor, Pastor Mandi, was very nice, very understanding, and all my friends uh, were all by my side. Mm -hmm. So yes, after that. Is uh, this multi, uh, multi-nationalities or primarily a Kenyan church? multinationalities okay. yes okay. I mean the majority because maybe the pastor is from Kenya the majority of the congregation is Kenyan okay. but other other people from everywhere go Americans to go as well and since then 2012 the church has really grown okay that time it was a tiny tiny church well there is a substantial Kenyan population here yes very very true yeah. and then after that that's when I started really the West Michigan Kenyan community mm -hmm. um, and the pastor was also joining, uh, interested in that part of the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really was very well received, very, very well received. I was very genuinely trying to bring people together uh, in case somebody went through a difficult time financially or emotionally, then I wanted them to have a community. And I think one thing that a lot of Americans don't understand is their assumption is, oh, if you're going to move here, why don't you find an African-American community, an African-American mm -hmm. church, but culturally, historically, you have not a lot of shared experience. Other Very than true. walking down the street, some some white folks might say, oh, you both look the <laughs> same, but you have profoundly different uh, experiences. You have a lot that you don't share. And so um, associating with, with people from from your continent is really really meaningful and, re and really grounding. It was I very think. meaningful. I think for me, I wanted somebody who knew what it means if you have a sick parent. Our parents, yeah. we never put them in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. We we watch them until they die. Sure. So that's, it was hard, um, you know, somebody saying, you know, she could go to a hospice or, or a nursing home. They don't go. My grandmother lived with us, with my mom for sure. Sure. Forever. And it's just so, a cultural expectation. Yeah. Um, we're, our time is running short, and I just I really want to touch base on this huge new project of yours. You had this vision. You said Grand Rapids really needs an African festival. Talk about what you've yes. got cooking. Well, last year I, I started my own small business, Flora's Elegance Events Decor. And it's, I've attended an event where you were the, were the decorations company yes. and was quite lovely. Yes, yes, I love it. And it's named after my mom, Flora. So it has a lot, the branding name is um, based on her personality. Mm. And it's the elegance, the beauty from inside out. So my business- uh, And you're doing this on the side because you actually have a day job too. Yes, I have a full-time job at uh, the Cultural Intelligence Center, downtown Grand Rapids. And those people are doing really important work. But I wanna go back to the, the African festival before we run out of time. Yes. So, so when is it going to be? August 10. I would like to invite everybody to attend. It okay. will be wonderful. It will be fashion, food, entertainment, different uh, uh, songs and music from Africa. There will be also uh, comedians. I think I have two so far, one from Ethiopia, one from uh, Nigeria. We'll have um, local businesses uh, having their tables there. So mostly we'll have just all kinds of entertainment put together. At Rosa Parks Circle? At Rosa Parks Circle. And in the summer, it's a lovely in place summer, to be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can wear your t-shirts. and Yes, yeah. uh, we'll have volunteer shirts. We are still open to sponsors. Um, okay. And happily, just in the last while, you've gotten several sponsors on board. Yes, I can do. Can you tell us who, who is yes, yes. jumping uh, in? I'm very excited to say that um, Mobo Jihar, one of the um, mobility and parking uh, unit of the city is supporting us fantastic and they've been amazing and very supportive and also we do have downtown grand rapids inc mm -hmm. they are also sponsoring us i just had another wonderful um communication from experience gr mm -hmm. so they are supporting us as well 
and an old national bank Fantastic. downtown. Yeah. And I have a, at least a few more. Grand Valley is looking at our sponsorship. They are, they are sounding very interested. Mm. Uh, I also submitted a, an application to Spectrum and another company that's also very interested in supporting it is Avanti Law Firm. Oh, fantastic. Those yes. are good folks yes. doing good work there. Very, I, I, very I know much, those folks yes. as well. Yeah. Uh, so, but anytime you've got, you've got good weather, you've got good uh, food, you've got good music, uh, lots of people, it sounds like it's going to be a wonderful event. And I personally look forward on uh, attending. Uh, having lived in West Africa, part of my life, I yeah. uh, need to reconnect with those those long Please. past roots. Yes, yes. This yeah. is a vision I've had for a very long time and I'm excited to bring it alive in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I have always visualized downtown with uh, an African festival. Mm. Uh, it's growing. Uh, our town is becoming more diverse. Yes. And I'm so excited that an African festival will come down here too. It's, uh, as I said, um, based on like trying to bring people together through all my activities and through now that I have a small business, I think this is a platform to bring people together and also showcase talents, showcase small businesses, and just uh, enjoy some wonderful culture. That's fantastic. Yeah. We're going to have to leave it there, but I really want to thank you for coming by in this inhospitable weather yes. and, uh, and chatting with us today. And I wish you the best of luck. We will definitely keep in touch. Thank you so much, Alan, for you having bet. me. My pleasure. Yes. Thanks for joining us. If you're watching us on TV, Stay tuned for our following segments on language and culture. If you're watching Feel Like You Belong on the Internet, we hope you will share your feedback with us via our website and YouTube channel. Be sure to catch our many other stories about the inspiring immigrants who helped make these United States a better place.